Hello and welcome to this next session in the series of webinars by the Privacy, Security and Information Law team at Field Fisher. I'm Kwan Han, a director in that team, and in this session I'm joined by Nuria Pastor, a director also in the same team. And in this session we'll be answering questions put to us through various sources online. So these are the questions that we'll be answering today regarding data protection by design and by default in engineering, COVID vaccination status, DSAR requests, data subject access requests from platforms, the representative issue under the GDPR in the UK and in the EU post Brexit, and finally, NIS directive issues post Brexit. We have received several questions on SHREMS too, but for the purposes of today's session, we're not covering them. We're just providing a list of lots of blogs and also webinars on YouTube covering SHREMS too that you can check out. This question is about how to integrate data protection by design and by default into product design when the engineering department works in two week sprints. The first point here is that, yes, it's important to train engineers on key issues regarding data protection by default and by design, and indeed GDPR more generally, but they should be trained from an engineering rather than legal perspective. For example, throughout the data life cycle, data minimization is very important. Collect the minimum amount of data. Access, limit access to only those who need to access the data. Storage limitation, store the data for the least amount of time for which the data is needed, deleting or anonymizing it when it's no longer necessary for the original purpose. Bear in mind granularity where possible, for example, tagging sensitive data so you can find it easily and quickly. Associating expiry dates with particular data so that you have a flag or an alert to let you know when it should be deleted so you can consider whether to delete it. Logging as much as you can, particularly, of course, access to data and throughout security for all this data. But that said, engineers should be aware of some key legal aspects. For example, a lot of technical people tend to treat everything as the same. We're all one big company, one group, everything can be mixed up, but in fact, legally different legal entities are treated as different persons within the group and so it does matter whether it's one legal entity one company's data and then a sister or parent company might actually be storing it for them and the server might be owned by yet another company these differences do matter legally also the physical location of data and where the backups are located, that's also important. Does any other company or third party have remote access to the data wherever located? That's also important, um, for example, for support purposes. And also, which legal entity in the group holds the contracts with third party vendors that might be involved in hosting or processing the data? That also matters. And of course, don't forget that the so-called cookie law is also relevant when engineering, particularly, of course, websites, but also mobile apps. At the start of every project, make sure you involve the data protection officer, if any, and certainly data protection experts, and make sure you follow their guidance on the particular project, because it does make a difference whether, for example, the company that is engaged in the project is a controller or a processor under GDPR, data protection impact assessments might have to be conducted and certain mitigating measures have to be taken and so on. And throughout the project, make sure you maintain the lines of communication to the data protection officer and to the legal expert, to the privacy team, to the security team. Keep them involved throughout. Make sure you ask queries wherever you're not sure about certain aspects and then with all this, the length of individual sprints shouldn't matter. This question is about whether we can ask individuals information about their vaccination status 
to allow them to come back to the office or even as a condition to access a job. As COVID-19 restrictions ease in the UK, employers face the challenge of planning a gradual return to the office and putting measures in place to ensure their employees are safe. In this context, many employers, controllers under data protection law, will be wondering if they should monitor vaccination status or take a return to the office or job offers conditional on employees and candidates having received the vaccine. I'm going to be answering this question from a data protection point of view. There are employment law considerations that you should consider. This will not be covered, covered here. From a UK data protection standpoint, collection of employees' vaccination status data will be lawful, provided that there is a clear and compelling reason to do so. Employers will have to assess and document whether recording staff vaccination status data will help them to achieve this goal. Employers in certain industries, for example, health and social care providers, will be more likely to demonstrate that these activities are lawful as their employees are more likely to be in contact with patients infected with COVID-19 or with vulnerable people who could become infected. However, employers in other industries or settings may struggle to justify such measures. Employers will have to assess compliance with a proposed scheme with the principles of necessity, proportionality and fairness. Necessity. Employers will have to ask themselves whether the information is necessary and whether employers can achieve the same result without collecting that personal information. With regards to proportionality, employers should consider blanket schemes, which are likely to be proportionate, versus targeted schemes, depending on their business and workforce. The third principle is the principle of fairness. Consider any potential negative consequences for individuals, for example, the impact on those who cannot have the vaccine for medical reasons or simply because their age group has not been invited to have it yet or do not wish to do so. When planning to process vaccination status data, Employers should put measures in place to comply with the key data protection principles that are set out in the UK GDPR. All requirements will apply, but we would like to highlight the importance of being transparent with employees and keeping the data protected. And also to keep the data that is processed to a minimum. Employers must also process data for only for the purposes for which it was obtained. The risk of scope creep in such, fast -paced, in such a fast-paced environment is also great. So employers should be careful not to process data for further purposes. Furthermore, employers must ensure that they document the measures that they implement in compliance with the accountability principle by, for instance, carrying out a data protection impact assessment and setting out a vaccination status policy, which identifies the scope and extent of the programme. Our advice above is underpinned by the stricter restrictions set out by data protection law to the processing of special category data, as COVID-19 vaccination status would be because of the sensitive nature of the information. This next question is about DSAR, data subject access or other requests from third party platforms. Should you respond to these kind of requests? Now, the intention of allowing third parties to make data subject requests on behalf of the data subjects was to help out data subjects, but that doesn't mean there are no risks 
with the use of such platforms or portals. Some of them even take the data that's received and use it for their own purposes. But even with reputable platforms, it is possible to refuse to deal with the request made by the platform or portal. If you don't know who the individual is that it's about, you can't verify the identity, you don't have evidence that the third party is authorised by that individual to make the request on their behalf, then you can refuse the request. Time doesn't start running your, your period within which you have to answer the request unless and until you know all that information. You can also refuse to deal with the request, at least under ICO guidance in the UK, if you would have to click on a link in order to take it forward further and, and answer the request. Because, of course, it's a security risk to click on unknown links from unknown sources. Also, if in order to deal with the request, you have to create an account with a third party or pay or take other proactive steps, then according to the ICO, you can refuse to deal with the request. But in that sort of situation, you should contact the data subject directly, if you know who they are, of course, and give them the information where possible. If you can't, then explain the reasons for the refusal and offer to give them direct assistance if they get in touch with you directly. If you are a controller based outside of the EEA, but subject to the GDPR by virtue of its extraterritorial effect, you will have to appoint an EU representative. After the end of the Brexit implementation period, on 31st December 2020, your EU, EU representative cannot be located in the UK because the UK is not, no longer in the EU. You will have to appoint your EU representative in another EU member state. However, this cannot be any EU member state. It has to be a member state where the data subjects whose data are processed in relation to your offering of goods and services or whose behaviour is monitored are based. Remember to designate the representative in writing and that EU regulators may address the EU representative in addition or instead of you. The UK GDPR does also set out the requirement of appointing an EU representative, which is a similar role to the EU representative under the GDPR. Organisations outside of the UK who target individuals in the UK or monitor their, beha their behaviour will be required under the UK GDPR to appoint a UK representative in the UK. A final point to consider is that both the EU GDPR and the UK GDPR set out two exceptions to this requirement. First of all, public authorities or bodies will not have to appoint a representative. Furthermore, processing that is occasional and that does not include processing of special category of data or data relating to criminal convictions and offences at a large scale and that is unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals will not require the appointment of a representative. This final question is about the NIS Directive, the Network and Information Systems Security Directive. What do you need to do about appointing a NIS representative in the UK or indeed in the EU post Brexit? Do you have to care about the NIS Directive anyway? Just by way of recap, the NIS Directive was implemented in the UK under the NIS regulations and it's still in force in the UK post Brexit. Now, the main intention of this directive and the UK regulations was, as far as private parties are concerned, to impose security measures and incident reporting requirements on two classes of services. Essential services, basically critical infrastructure in certain sectors, or digital services. 
and both of these types of organizations, essential services and digital services, are subject to requirements regarding security and regarding incident reporting. And the difference is that for digital services, there was meant to be more of a lighter touch ex post approach to enforcement. This is a directive, so there are national differences. For example, in terms of fines, the top fine in the UK is 1717 million pounds, whereas, for example, in Germany, it's 50,000 euros. So quite a lot of differences. I would also add that digital services are not everything that you think of as a digital service. Digital service for this purpose is only cloud computing service, online marketplace or online search engine. So turning to the UK, post Brexit, if you offer a quote unquote digital service in the UK, you have to appoint and register a UK representative with the UK Information Commissioner's Office. And you should have done this in April 2021 or three months after first offering services in the UK. If you previously had registered a UK establishment with the ICO, then you might think, well, there's no need to appoint and register a representative even if your head office is not in the UK in practical terms. I'm not going to talk about essential services because there's no time, just digital services. Moving on to the EU, if previously you had your NIS main establishment in the UK for a one-stop shop purposes before Brexit, then that meant that you would answer only to the UK regulator. Obviously, the UK is no longer in the EU, so you'll have to have a main establishment somewhere else in the EU if you want to answer or continue to answer to just one NIS regulator in the EU. So for NIS purposes, you do have to decide if you offer your digital services in the EU, where should you have your main establishment? Where do you have your main establishment? Can you do anything to do that? rather than be subject to action from uh, enforcement action, I should say, from all uh, possible regulators under NIS in the EU. Now, some people might say, well, I'm not that bothered about the NIS directive. I haven't heard of any fines so far. Just because you haven't heard of fines doesn't mean there haven't been any. Um, they're not publicizing necessarily fines that have been imposed under the NIS directive because all of this is considered um, national security related in many ways, critical infrastructure, digital services that underpin particularly critical infrastructure or other important economic or societal activities. Also, another aspect that's relevant is that the European Commission is beefing up the NIS directive with what's called the NIS 2 directive that will replace the NIS directive. And that was just proposed in December 2020. Uh, it probably will be a few years before that's in force, but that is broader. It's going to bring more companies or types of companies into scope like data centers. Um, cloud computing is moved from what was digital services into essential services. Digital services becomes important services, so you have essential and important services, and social networking services will become important. So um, this is broader, it'll be tougher because there will be GDPR level fines, at least at the lower tier. Uh, so just generally, if you are prepared under the NIS directive, you're going to be in a better position to comply with the NIS 2 directive when it comes in with its tougher fines. Thank you very much for listening to our Q&A session and for sending your questions. Goodbye.